with questions from the Prime Minister, Andrew Lower. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I should begin by saying that we, of course, condemn the attack on Iraqi military bases hosting coalition forces. Iran should not repeat these reckless and dangerous attacks, but must instead pursue urgent de-escalation. Mr Speaker, I know that the thoughts of the House are also with our friends in Australia as they tackle the bushfires, as they are with the families of those killed in the Ukrainian air crash. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Andrew Law. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, motor neurone disease is a, a terrible terminal illness, with a third of people dying within a year and more than half within two years of diagnosis. The last thing terminally ill people and their families should be worrying about are their finances. Yeah, yeah. The Scrap Six Months campaign by the Motor Neurone Disease Association which is based in my constituency of Northampton South, has managed to bring the important issue of payments to those with terminal illnesses to the fore. And I welcome the Department of Work and Pensions review of the special rules for terminal illness announced last July. But can I ask the Prime Minister to join me in pressing the DWP to complete its review and to scrap six months? Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to my honourable friend and the work he's doing for those suffering from, uh, from motor neurone disease, which is indeed a, a terrible illness. And uh, we're doing everything we can to ensure that the welfare system works for sufferers of that illness. And that's why the Department of Work and Pensions is, is indeed looking at how they can change uh, the way we help people nearing the end of their life uh, with the most severe conditions, including motor uh, neuro disease. And I'm sure that uh, my friend, honourable friend, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for DWP, would be only too happy to meet my honourable friend uh, at an early uh, meeting, early, 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 early convenience. Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to start by paying tribute to Andrew Miller, the former member for Ellesmere Port in Neston, who sadly died on Christmas Eve. He sadly lost in, uh, to this House. He spent over 20 years here, was an expert on science and technology, made an enormous contribution to this House. Our thoughts are with his family and his friends, and he's deeply lost, uh, mourned on this, on this side of the House for the great contribution that he made. I also join the Prime Minister in sending sympathies and support to friends in Australia, where the fires have claimed over 20 people, along with the loss of human life, hundreds of millions of animals have also been destroyed as a result of this. This is a warning of what global warming does to all of us, and we've got to take this very, very seriously, the threat of climate change. And I join the Prime Minister also in thoughts going to the friends and family of those who died, sadly, in the Ukrainian plane that crashed in Tehran last night. Mr. Speaker, following last night's attack on the United States bases in Iraq, can the Prime Minister confirm that he opposes any further retaliation or escalation in violence in a situation where the region is in real risk of going into a full-scale war? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course I can confirm that, and I can point out to the Honourable right Gentleman that the United Kingdom has been working uh, solidly since the crisis began uh, to bring together in particular our, our European allies in uh, their response. And the House will have noted the, the E3 uh, declaration that was issued by uh, France, Germany and the United Kingdom in which we drew particular attention to the baleful role played in the region for a very long time. Uh, by Qasem uh, Soleimani, and that was a collective uh, European view, but a view that doesn't ap yet appear to be shared uh, by the right honourable gentleman. I've been interested in all his commentary uh, that he hasn't yet raised that matter. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, following the government's support to the United States over the assassination of General Soleimani, is the Prime Minister confident that United Kingdom troops and civilians are not at further risk in the region and beyond? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can of course uh, confirm, and that's an important question, that, uh, that the, uh, as far as we can tell, and the, 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 there were no casualties last night sustained by uh, the US and no British personnel were injured in the 
uh, in the attacks. And we are doing everything we can, of course, to protect UK interests in the region with uh, HMS Defender and HMS Montrose operating in an enhanced state of readiness to protect shipping in the Gulf. And as the House heard yesterday from my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Defence, we've relocated uh, non-essential personnel uh, from Baghdad uh, to Taji. And uh, we will do everything that we can to prevent an escalation. Jeremy Cobb. The government has said that it's sympathetic to the assassination of General Soleimani. What evidence has the Prime Minister got to suggest that this attack on him and his death was not an illegal act by the United States? Well, Mr Speaker, clearly the, uh, the strict issue of legality is not for the UK to determine, since it was not our operation. But I think that uh, most reasonable people would accept that the United States has a right to protect its bases and its, and its personnel. And I would remind the House that the individual concerned, Qasim Soleimani, was not only, is, was not only responsible for many years, uh, amongst other things, arming the Houthis with missiles with which they uh, attacked innocent civilians, arming Hezbollah with missiles which, again, they used to attack innocent civilians, sustaining the Assad regime in Syria, one of the most brutal and barbaric regimes in the world, and, of course, supplying uh, improvised explosive devices to terrorists who, I'm afraid, killed and maimed British troops. That man had the blood of British troops on his hands. Mr Speaker, if we stand by international law, as I'm sure the government does and would want to, then surely killing somebody in a foreign territory is an illegal act and should be condemned as such. If we believe in international law, that should be the solution to the problems in the world. And as a permanent and as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, can the, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, could the government say what representations have been made to ensure that uh, the Iranian officials that want to attend the Security Council in order to try to bring about a resolution to the very dangerous situation in the region will be allowed to attend, and in the event of the US administration blocking them, what representations will he personally make to President Trump to make sure the UN can operate in the way that it should and must be able to operate? Well, uh, as I think the right honourable gentleman is probably uh, well aware that uh, the United States has a duty under international law to allow people to visit the UN, and that in, is indeed the position that the UK supports. Jeremy Cobb. Iraqi Parliament passed a resolution calling for foreign troops to leave their country. Can the Prime Minister confirm that the British Government will respect any decision made by a sovereign parliament and government in Iraq that may make such a request in the future and will respect, and will respect the sovereignty of Iraq as a nation? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I spoke, as, as the House can imagine, I, I've spoken extensively to uh, our, our friends around the world, including our friends in Baghdad. Uh, and Prime Minister Adil Mehdi, who, of course, has, like uh, many people in Iraq, has come to rely and depend on the support of coalition forces, not least from the UK. And as you will know, there is a very significant NATO mission uh, in Iraq at the moment, helping in the fight against Daesh. And I think it is, uh, it is my wish, the wish of this government, I think it should be the wish of this House, that we should do everything that we can to support the security and integrity of, the, of Iraq and of the Iraqi people. Jeremy Corbyn. My question was if the government would respect the sovereignty of Iraq, its parliament and its government, and the Prime Minister did not answer that question. The United States actions have undoubtedly escalated the risk of a dangerous conflict and in an already destabilised region, putting civilians, UK troops and nationals at risk and leaving the Iran nuclear deal in danger of being dead in the water. This government's response is not putting the interests of this country first, but instead seems more interested in prioritising the Prime Minister's relationship with President Trump over the security of the region and of this country. Isn't the truth, isn't the truth Mr Speaker, 
that this Prime Minister is unable to stand up to President Trump because he's hitched his wagon to a trade deal with the United States, and that prioritises everything else that he ought to be considering. Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, I was kind of waiting for the little green men thing yeah. to come out at the end about, about the, uh, the, the trade deal. Uh, this is absolute fiction. Uh, but uh, what I will say is that the UK will continue to work for de-escalation uh, in the region. I think we're having a great deal of success in bringing together a European response and in uh, bridging that, the European response with that, of course, of our American friends and working both with the Iranians and uh, with the Iraqis to dial this Thing down. But he should be in absolutely no doubt. And uh, this is, a, of course, a leader of the opposition who has famously received £10,000 uh, from the Iranian press TV. Uh, he, should be, he, should be, he should be in absolutely no doubt that we are determined to guarantee with all the, everything that we can the safety and security of the people of Iraq, uh, whereas he, of course, would disband NATO. And it is this government that will continue to stick up stick up for the people across the Middle East who have suffered, who have suffered at the hands of Qasem Soleimani and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Quds Force that he has led and whose terrorism uh, he has promoted. And I am very surprised at the end of these exchanges that he has yet to condemn the activities of Qasem Soleimani and the Revolutionary Guard. In the last 10 years, there have been volumes of reports, independent reviews and recommendations calling for an end to inappropriate inpatient care for people with learning disabilities or challenging behaviour. In the wake of the Winterbourne View scandal alone, there were seven such reports. As we start a new decade, would my right honourable friend state how many people are still trapped in inappropriate care settings and instruct the Department of Health to act on those recommendations and the asks of families and campaigners so these very vulnerable people can get the care they need and deserve? I I thank my right honourable friend for the passionate campaign that she uh, she, uh, wages. I can tell her the number, this current number is 2,190, which is patently uh, unacceptable, but it is moving down. Uh, uh, My right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, uh, tells me the number is coming down uh, rapidly. We have a a pledge to reduce it by 50%, and I'm sure that uh, he will meet her very shortly. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome you to your place? Wish you, all members and staff, a good new year. And I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister for our friends in Australia and the tragedy of the Ukrainian airline crash. And, Mr Speaker, we want to see a resumption of democracy in Iraq. We want to see the return to peace. And, of course, we support all measures to make sure that diplomatic efforts can get us to a better place. Mr Speaker... Prime Minister, who should determine the future of Scotland? The Prime Minister or the people who live in Scotland? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the answer is is, is very clear. It's the people of Scotland who voted decisively uh, only only four or five years ago to stay stay members of the most successful political partnership in history uh, by a decisive majority in a a once-in-a-generation choice. Mr Speaker, this is about democracy. In 2016, the people of Scotland voted to remain in the European Union, yet they are being dragged out of Europe against their will by this Prime Minister. In 2019, the people of Scotland elected a majority of SNP MPs to Westminster. The Scottish National Party won the election on the premise of Scotland's right to choose its own future, rejecting the Prime Minister who lost more than half his seats in Scotland. Mr Speaker, today the Scottish Parliament will decline legislative consent to the withdrawal we are deliberating later today. Why is this Conservative Government dismissing the will of the people of Scotland Ignore of their voicing and disregarding our Parliament. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I think the real question is why does the SNP keep going on about breaking up the most successful union in history yeah. to distract, to distract from their abundant failures in government? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
in spite of getting an extra nine billion, in spite of getting nine billion pounds a year from the UK exchequer, which of course they would lose if they were so foolish as to break away, uh, they are they are mismanaging their they are mismanaging their health care, and you're seeing, I'm afraid, no, it is not the fault of Scottish uh, pupils, but you're seeing Scottish Scottish schools falling behind in in educational sense. Concentrate on what you're doing and stop going on about about breaking up the union. At the heart of our One Nation government is our manifesto commitment a strong society needs strong families. Yeah. After last week's £165 million boost to extend the Troubled Families programme, will the Prime Minister outline how the government will additionally fulfil our manifesto pledge to champion family hubs to, and I quote from our manifesto, serve vulnerable families with the intensive integrated support they need to care for our children. Well, I I pay tribute to my honourable friend for all that she has done to campaign for families, and it was thanks to her, I think, that uh, we put family hubs in the manifesto. Uh, So so, so, uh, be be in no doubt that we're working now with uh, with local authorities to champion and to deliver family hubs. Thank you. Finally, it appears that some action is being taken against Northern Rail. Will the Prime Minister commit to stripping them of their franchise and will he also commit to devolving the power and the money to the regions so that local people have the power over their local transport and never have to suffer the appalling catalogue of delays, overcrowding, cancellations and disruptions that have gone on far too long? Well, I, I have to say to the Honourable Lady that I must I share her outrage, and I do understand uh, what, she, uh, what, what she is saying, and uh, we are developing contingency plans for a, uh, a replacement uh, for Northern uh, Rail. But what we are also doing, and, and she raises the point, uh, we are also looking at the whole way uh, the franchising system operates, and she'll have seen the Keith Williams' uh, re- very, very valuable report on that. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. My right honourable friend has always been a vocal advocate of localism. So what advice can he give to my constituents who are concerned about the local Lib Dem Council's unwanted housing plan in Eastleigh, which would lead to, which would lead to even more overdevelopment without securing the vital infrastructure that Eastleigh needs? Uh, well, my, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised at what he says about the cavalier uh, behaviour of Lib Dem, uh, of Lib Dem Councils in uh, in East Eastley, uh, we will make sure that, insofar as we need to build many more homes, which we do, we will of course supply the infrastructure necessary and do it on brownfield sites. Joe Williams, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Prime Minister is a, a man of vision, apparently. Uh, what is his vision for the constitutional relationship between Wales and England in the events of Irish reunification and Scottish independence? The, 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 our relationship, like the relationship of the whole United Kingdom, will go from strength to strength. American company Wheelabrator has a track record of breaching environmental legislation in the USA and now seeks to build a massive incinerator in the beautiful Tess Valley. Local residents are looking to this government because of their concerns about emissions levels and are seeking reassurance from my right honourable friend that regulations on emissions from incineration will be further enhanced and greener alternatives encouraged. Uh, well, I, I've, I've, see, I've seen her point with great uh, concern, Mr Speaker, because as we move to a, uh, a net zero economy, which we rule by 2050, under this groundbreaking Conservative uh, government, uh, it is vital that we tackle that kind of emissions. That's why we're establishing an Office for Environmental uh, Protection, and I will chair a new Cabinet committee uh, to drive forward action on climate change across the whole of government. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and a happy new year to you and all your staff and everyone in the House. The Prime Minister knows that his Get Brexit Done slogan was vacuous. He also knows it's not even the end of the beginning, with no deal firmly back on the table. So, will he now acknowledge that any job lost? and any impact on British industry as a result of his Brexit policy is firmly at his door. Uh, Mr Speaker, contrary to the predictions of the, of the Gloomsters, uh, unemployment is at a record low. We've put on about 800,000 jobs since the, since the referendum and we, we, we will indeed get Brexit done by January the 31st. Michael Tomlin. 
So, um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. For, for social justice, for life chances, for opportunities for the next generation, education is the key. And that is why the Prime Minister's pledge for additional funding is so welcome, especially for historically underfunded areas such as Dorset and Poole. But equally important are discipline and standards. Will the Prime Minister ensure that there is a continued focus on the most disadvantaged, especially when it comes to vital literacy and numeracy skills? Black. Yes, indeed I will, Mr Speaker, and I, I pay tribute, uh, by the way, to uh, my hon. the member for Chichester, I think, is he, where is he, who, who campaigned for so long for synthetic, synthetic phonics, which has done such a huge amount uh, to help uh, kids to read in this country. This is the, the only country in the G7 where performance of disadvantaged pupils has actually improved in reading uh, since 2009. Uh, we need to do more and, as my honourable friend says, that is why we are investing more now at record sums in education. Brendan yeah, yeah, yeah. O'Hara. Yeah, 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 yeah. Margaret Thatcher, John Major yeah, 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 yeah. and his own immediate predecessor all accepted that the Union of the United Kingdom can only be maintained by consent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Margaret Thatcher, my major and his immediate predecessor, all accepted. They all accepted that the Union of the United Kingdom can only be maintained by consent. Yet, despite winning three elections seeking to test that consent, the Prime Minister insists that the SNP government does not have a mandate to hold another independence referendum. So could he tell me exactly what mechanism is available to the Scottish people to give their consent or otherwise for maintaining this union? Yeah, and how yeah, yeah. should they go about exercising that? Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I can only repeat my, uh, my point, which is that the Scottish people do have a, a mechanism. Uh, they used it in 2014. It's a referendum. Uh, and uh, it took place. It took place. And it was, as, as I think members opposite all confirmed, it was a once-in-a-generation yeah. event. David Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, you being a Northern MP like myself would welcome the news that there's going to be more money spent in the north of England. I want to reiterate that Morecambe needs the Eden project, and would my right honourable friend the Prime Minister like to come to Morecambe and see me and the Eden team <laughs> about getting the Eden project back in Morecambe again to make Morecambe the best place on the face of this earth? Yes, uh, indeed, Mr Speaker, the Eden uh, of, of, of uh, of, the, of Britain. I, I just heard from my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, that he does indeed, Mr Speaker, the House should know that the Eden project is now, thanks to the Chancellor, very likely to come to Morecambe. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. For more than two years, I have been campaigning on behalf of my constituents in Hart Hill and 4,000 other low-income road chef workers across the UK who have waited more than 20 years to receive share ownership money that is rightfully theirs. In 2018, there was a breakthrough when HMRC agreed to repay millions of pounds in wrongfully paid tax. However, I understand that they are trying now to recoup tax on every penny possible from those low-income workers. Yep. Given that the Trust was set up as a non-tax employee ownership yep. scheme, does the Prime Minister think it is fair that HMRC would seek to run roughshod over that, and will he now meet with me in order to discuss this protracted saga? Yes, uh, yes of course. So I'm a, I make a general point that we've done a, a huge amount to uh, raise uh, to raise the burden of, to lift the burden of taxation on uh, the low paid and we're lifting the living wage by the biggest ever increase. But I, I know that my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, will welcome the opportunity to discuss the particular matter uh, he raises in person. Shirley Schwarzer. In the period 2018 to 2019, overseas companies investing in Northern Ireland created nearly 1,500 new jobs. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that if Stormont were to be up and running again, yeah. Then this year, that number would be considerably yeah, higher, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that it is important that no stone is left unturned in efforts by the Northern Ireland parties to seek agreement so that the Northern Ireland Assembly can be properly functioning again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to say the UK is now the third highest recipient of foreign investment in the world, yeah. but Northern Ireland could get even more than it currently does if, as my right honourable friend rightly says, if uh, people took their responsibilities and got Stormont up and running again. Yeah, yeah. Tommy Shepherd. Mr Speaker, in the twilight of the last Parliament, both the Scottish Affairs and Health Select Committees produced reports on the drugs crisis. Both reports drew on international evidence and recommended a change in the law to allow vulnerable addicts to be able to consume substances in secure facilities under medical supervision. Now, I know this is a complex and uh, and controversial area, and I'm not expecting the Prime Minister to make policy in the hoof. But I want to ask him, will he consider on a pilot basis the establishment of overdose prevention centres in order to gather evidence as to whether this could help prevent deaths in this country as it has in other countries? Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member because he's raising a very important issue and a difficult problem. And the, the question is, how do you uh, introduce, as it were, consumption rooms without encouraging consumption? That's the, the challenge that we face. As he knows, we are having a drugs summit uh, in, this year. Uh, it will be held in, in Scotland, and uh, we will be announcing a date shortly. Deanna Davidson. My local NHS Trust is currently consulting on closing the Stroke Rehabilitation Service at Bishop Auckland Hospital. Staff on the ward are rightly very concerned about this proposed closure and the impact that it will have on local residents, particularly those in my rural communities. So, can I ask the Prime Minister, are you willing to work with myself and the Health Secretary to take this matter seriously and prove yes. to the residents of Bishop Auckland that we're on their side? Yes. Well, can I congratulate my honourable friend? And welcome her and indeed all new colleagues to their first edition of, of Prime Minister's uh, Question Time. Thank, you, thank, her to, thank her for raising her concerns uh, with me. I'm, I, I've heard just now from uh, the Health Secretary passing the ball straight down the line uh, that he is, uh, he, is, he is indeed going to address the matter that she raises as fast as, as possible. As she knows, we're putting record sums into the NHS and it is our intention to help Bishop Auckland. Liam Fletcher. Like much of the rest of the country, hospital a &E waiting times in Coventry have been under constant pressure, with the latest figures showing that almost a quarter of attendances are waiting four hours or more to be seen. I am aware that the Government has made commitments to invest in the NHS. So would the Prime Minister agree to meet a delegation from Coventry to discuss the prospect of opening a second walk-in centre in the city to alleviate some of the pressure on our overstretched A&E department? I thank her for raising the issue with me, and if I can't do it, I'm sure that the Health Secretary can. Sir David Evanet. Does my right honourable friend share my concerns about the lack of educational achievement and aspiration among so many of our working class boys across the country? Will he make it a top priority for his government to ensure that all school children throughout the country are given the opportunities to maximise their talents? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I can, Mr Speaker. And not, not only are we investing record sums in, in primary and secondary education, but we're also setting up a national skills fund uh, to help those who don't necessarily think that they uh, are, are candidates for university but have a huge amount uh, to offer the economy and need every help uh, they can get. They have massive, massive potential. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Happy New Year to you and everyone else in the chamber. Can the Prime Minister detail what steps he has taken, working in concert with Germany and France, in helping to restore the Iran nuclear deal since he was appointed Prime Minister in July? Uh, well, I, I'm grateful to the, the Honourable Member. He raises a very important point, and uh, as, as he knows, it's, it is our view that the, the JCPOA remains the best way of preventing uh, nuclear proliferation uh, in Iran, the best way of, of encouraging the Iranians not to develop a, a nuclear weapon. And uh, we think that after uh, this crisis has abated, which of course we sincerely hope it will, uh, that that uh, way forward uh, will remain. It, it is a shell that has currently been voided, but it remains a shell into which we can put substance again. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In, uh, in recent months, the performance of West Midlands Rail for my constituents and for constituents across 
the region has been absolutely woeful. Will he agree with Andy Street, the West Midlands Mayor, that uh, if they do not shape up by the end of January, that they too should have a, uh, an inspection by uh, the Secretary of State for Transport and potentially have their franchise taken away? Yeah. Uh, 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 Mr Speaker, the House will have heard what I had to say already to the Honourable Lady about the performance of uh, various franchise holders across our rail network. We are looking at the, the whole issue and uh, the bell is tolling uh, for, uh, for West Midlands Rail, if I, if I hear uh, my Honourable Friend correctly. Chapman. Uh, during the festive uh, season, I've been thinking about Prime Minister basking in his hammock and mustique, uh, maybe contemplating his mandate. But the, the, <laughs> the mandate is absolutely nothing compared with the mandate won by my colleagues here on the benches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Winning 45% of the popular vote and 80% of the seats. Our mandate is unassailable. So the Prime Minister's holidays are over, and it's now time to li- deliver on that mandate. The Scottish Government has a nub and ready Edinburgh Agreement 2.0. <laughs> when will discussions begin? Uh, I, Mr Speaker, I think, I think I've given this answer a couple of times already. Uh, the, the people of Scotland had the chance uh, to decide. They decided emphatically in favour of remaining in the, in the UK. And, and that, I think, I think that, decision, that decision should be respected. Steve Double. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I warmly welcome the, the, our Prime Minister's commit, continued commitment to invest and level up across our country? This will be particularly welcome in Cornwall, that continues to be one of the poorest parts of the UK. So, will the Prime Minister confirm to the people of Cornwall that we will continue to be at the heart of his government's plans to invest in the regions of the country? Yes. Uh, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. I can confirm that. And, uh, uh, my honourable friend and I have discussed this issue many times. Not only will Cornwall will continue to receive all the cash it gets through the shared prosperity fund, but we will do extraordinary things with infrastructure, the A303, you name it, uh, to I- improve uh, transport to Cornwall, road transport, NHS, rail transport, yeah. and, and the NHS uh, as well. Truro, Penzance, and virtually every hospital in, hospital in Cornwall, Anson Hospital, uh, <laughs> will we'll be there. Final question, Colton. Yeah. Thank you. Mr Speaker, in 2005, my constituent, Stephen Gallant, did a bad thing for which he is serving a life sentence in prison. But on the 29th of November, he was the third man on London Bridge. He wrestled the knife-wielding, murderous terrorist to the ground so that police marksmen could shoot him dead. Stephen is rightly serving life in prison, but will the Prime Minister congratulate and pay tribute to Stephen for his bravery that day, which no doubt saved lives? Well, Mr Speaker, I I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question and for making a very good point, which I think the whole House would agree. I am lost in admiration for the the bravery of uh, Stephen Gallant and, indeed, others who went to the assistance of members of the public uh, on that day and, and fought a, uh, a very determined terrorist. And uh, I, uh, it obviously, it's not for the government uh, to decide these things, but it is my hope that that gallantry uh, will, in due course, be recognised in the proper way. Point of order, Helen Bedell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I seek your advice. Yesterday, on re-entering the building for the first time after Christmas, I witnessed one of the worst cases of abuse of security staff that I have seen in my time here. One of the members of the other place, who I will name so as not to incriminate anybody else, Lord Ken McGuinness, had forgotten his pass, something that we have all been guilty of. However, instead of taking the advice of the security staff, who, as we all know, are here for our security and our safety, he proceeded to verbally abuse and shout at both the member of staff, calling them (laughs) crooked, saying did they not know who he was, he had been here for 46 years, and refusing to take the advice and assistance of both myself, the security staff and the police that then attended. I have reported this incident to the authorities, but I seek your advice, as the member is not elected. So I am interested to know to whom he is accountable 
and what can be done to make sure no member of staff on the estate is ever treated in that way or abused in the manner which I and others witnessed yesterday? First of all, let me say, no member of staff of either house should have to put up with abuse. Yeah. I would say we have a policy that runs through all of this estate, and I would always encourage members to respect the people who are carrying out their duties to make sure we are safe. And that's what I would also say is normally we would not name a member of either house in this way, but what I do take very seriously is that staff carrying out their duties should not have to put up with abuse. What I would say is we are aware of the situation. I would expect those in another place to look into that. And I want to reassure those staff that they it will not be tolerated and we will ensure that that message goes across to all members of both houses. Point of order. Point of order, Michael Fabric. Mr Speaker, I don't think it will have escaped anybody's attention, but nevertheless I think it's worth making the point that we went through all the names yeah. on the order paper for Prime Minister's questions and a number of other colleagues on both sides got in and we finished at about 12.31 yeah. and no one, and no one had...